In three, two, one. Ah, fuck. Here we go. Three, two, one. Oh. Hold on. Who's your? It's April 19th, 2020. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Don't hurt nobody with your bad self. And welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast. It's been determined length. Episode number 550. And uh, we've already started the shade. Started. <laughs> yeah. But uh, continued. Uh, but uh, uh, help us with today's topic, and uh, also maybe provide some shade of his own because uh, he's just one handsome devil. Uh, we have Q, aka Michael Quinnishet. Yay! Thanks for having me. Guess who's back in the house? <laughs> I mean, two COL shows in a row, literally, mm-hmm. in less than four days. Double trouble. Mm-hmm. And... What well, was so good the first time? We just had to have more. Uh huh. You always come back for seconds when you like the thing you like. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. Seconds aren't even sloppy. Anyways. <laughs> well, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Where's that shape at? Uh. <laughs> there we go anyways gary what are we talking about today um we gotta we gotta get into something um might be controversial eh. Dif- difficult to gauge i don't know if the four of us will be on the same side or not i know that there are people who have already expressed opinions on the internets uh about this topic prior to us discussing it that were surprising to me. So uh, today's show is called The Blood Ban. And girl, it's not about vampires. So here's the thing. I mean, uh, they do want to suck your blood. Well, most people enjoy a good suck every now and then. Um, uh, <laughs> bing. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Uh, for those that are not aware... On April 2nd, just a mere 17 days ago, a couple weeks, uh, the U.S. FDA, Food and Drug Administration, made big news when uh, they updated their policy to allow men who have sex with men to donate blood if they have not been with another male sexually for three months versus the previous 12-month limitation. Okay. Um, For those that are not aware in the history of the um, FDA and blood donations um, basically since uh, 1985 when the FDA um, kind of began their processing of definitions they created an indefinite um, limitation that men who have sex with men that they could never donate blood and then that changed in 2015 and it was updated to if it was within 12 months that you had not had sex with another man, that you could um, not donate blood. But if you had been basically abstinent um, for a year plus, then you could donate. So this big, big deal in terms of like something that has been ongoing for many decades, uh, I was very excited about it. I was also caught off guard about it working in the field that i do now um it hit the wire right after uh, we had gotten done with work on that thursday and i immediately um sent a message to my work wife it was like what the fuck and sent her a link (laughs) 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 because we had no heads up um not that we are a blood donation facility but still like 
the fact that she and I work in HIV, you know, and that's the kind of the basis of, of the limitation that has been existing and stuff. Um, yeah. So, and she was like, does this mean what I think it means? I was like, yeah, like they reduced it all the way down to three months. So if you, you know, have been abstinent 90 days or longer, you can actually uh, donate. I was super excited about it. I was combing on social media. I thought it was going to like make headlines all over the world. Like, you know, at least in terms of the gay sphere and uh, not so much. <laughs> it was a little bit of a slow rollout uh -huh. in terms of the news. And then I was not prepared for people coming for this change. That people got opinions and it was very much uh, consistently. I saw a middle finger. Basically, like to the FDA and to the CDC and to our government. And like, I was just like, uh, oh, okay. So <laughs> I'm, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have knowledge on my side and I'm probably going to say a bunch of things in this episode in the hope of educating some people who may have differing opinions to help broaden their awareness i'll put it that way mm -hmm. i don't expect to change people's opinions but mm -hmm. yeah so before we get into all that though i'm curious to know what the rest of y'all thought like when you found out about that like if you if it moved you in any way like yay nay meh like you know q why don't you go first since you're our oh. guest okay yeah thank you um so yeah when i first um heard about it i i thought that um, I thought it was great news, um, enough to be able to, you know, post it on, uh, on Facebook. I wanted people to know that this is a thing and this is important. So I was happy with it. Now, um, I, uh, still, <laughs> uh, am ineligible, uh, but, um, but I think that, uh, it's a great way for the, um, just to, to get more donors. I mean, for me, it's a very simple concept. I mean, we're running out of blood because of the shelter in place, because we're supposed to stay home. People still need blood, regardless of whether COVID-19 happened or not. And so mm -hmm. I think that it's just, I'm, I'm glad that there's finally, um, at least they've, they've um, loosened up some of the restrictions. Um, so I can understand the pushback for sure. I understand uh, some of the other side. Um, but for me, I think that any progress is progress. So that's generally what I think. Baby steps. Yeah. yeah and and, and steps. I, don't, I don't know about you, but indefinite to 12 months, that's huge. Because it was not mm -hmm. at all to just don't have sex with men for, for a year. And now it's three months, and considering how far we're into this uh, 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 shelter-in-place thing, a lot more people will be eligible because a lot less people are having sex. Well, I'm not saying people aren't having sex. I'm saying less people. <laughs> no, I know. Okay. That's where I was like, I was like, sure, a couple months into this, there may be a new population that theoretically would qualify to donate. And, and I mean, yeah, it's it's not like overall ideal where it's like, have you like simple questions like, have you had sex with them? Yes. Have you been tested within the past three months or something like that? You, you know, just to kind of do a little screening screening process mm -hmm. to begin with. And then then to a point where hopefully eventually it's like, uh, you know, there isn't uh, the specific advisement of you can't have sex with men for, for three months. It's you've had safe sex or, you know, what have you. Right. So baby steps. I, I'm good with the baby steps. I'm fine. <laughs> yes, not ideal, but it's good. This is a win. Of course, this could also be they're desperate. <laughs> they're like, because people are mm -hmm. now sheltering in place, they're they're not going out at all unless they have absolutely have to. They haven't thought of the fact that hey, what's essential? Blood. 
you can give blood now and and opening up those possibilities and when when it's like well six months ago i had sex with a man so i can't can't do anything right now and i, ha I would have to wait another six months and who knows this Sit, whole thing will have blown over and then you just don't think about it and then more people are giving blood because they're not sheltering in place anymore because the whole thing is blown over you know it's it's one of those kind of catch-22 things where it's like they probably did this more of opening up the uh, number of people who would be eligible now because this is the point where we really need people to be donating more blood mm-hmm yeah, I mean, generally, I think that they are desperate, you know, and so um, reading the entire article, um, it's not just opening up the um, loosening restrictions for MSM, you know, it also is for those who have had uh, tattoos. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, I think, one other, one or two other pieces within uh, that as well so it's not just a, a gay thing um mm -hmm. and there i think they just looked at the requirements and said how can we get more people in the pool to donate blood so this is just one of the things that they um have chosen to uh loosen the restrictions of yeah. and, and i of, think yeah yeah and for tattoos a lot of reputable tattoo parlors will it, are still very sanitary are, are very sanitary when it comes to giving tattoos so there's less of a uh, issue in regards to that i don't know what other reasons if it was just uh because uh because of the needles and such like that that they could transmit disease but um if there was something else in regards to just because you have a tattoo there's something that affects your blood or something like that and not necessarily diseases uh, specifically like metals or something i don't know i don't know how the specifics work on on the tattoo stuff but i'm assuming it means just unsanitary needles from cat tattoos could cause diseases that go into the bloodstream which cause um causes problems uh but a lot of the times at least every the okay two times that i've gotten a tattoo it been very sanitary. There's been a lot of, you know, the alcohol wipes and they sanitize the needles beforehand and, and everything like that. So it's good that they're loosening restrictions on that, especially when a lot of tattoo parlors are being responsible when it comes to sanitation. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I think, I you know, um, I would like to see more data. I haven't looked at everything. So for me, the going from 12 month restriction to three month restriction, um, I can, I can understand, I think in my brain, the three month restriction, but I really need more data. To understand. Like I just need more data. Like why three months? Why not four months? Why not a month? Why not a week? Why not a day? Well, like what, like what is it about three months that they chose so isn't three months when, like, the I don't want to say the maximum, but, but I believe it's something ha has to do with something in regards to, like, uh, H HIV infection. Like, Gary, can you back me up? <laughs> there, I feel like there's there's that limit is, is there because, you know, someone who, like, for me, I'm on um, Truvada for PrEP, and I should be tested every three months in order to get my next supply. It's to kind of prove confirm that i'm still hiv negative and it's done every three months because of i'm sure there's a reason for it but that's the only thing i can think of off the top of my head that there's a three month sometimes it doesn't show up for three months right so this is part of the where i was talking about like the educating piece because mm -hmm. um, i think that people who are having a negative reaction to the to the change in the time frame are like not good enough why is it got to be 90 days why can't it be four weeks why can't it be one week like why can't like because the theory the the layman's uh imaginative concept is all the blood that is ever donated is tested so the theory holds simplistically no matter who gives blood, it's all tested, and it doesn't matter what your exposure is in the past. So why does it matter? 
And I think that's fair. What people don't realize is like the science behind donations and your lay period um, and how quickly tests can find things in the blood. So while, yes, all the blood is tested, the questions that are asked, the forms that are used, the ability of the Red Cross or a blood bank or a hospital or anybody to determine if someone, you know, should be deferred is based on trust. So by asking the question, we're expecting people to self-identify, to be honest mm -hmm. in that. And it is true, and it has been shown in some studies, you know, that people have lied because they donated blood and then the blood came back positive. And that's a whole other thing that's got to be dealt with then because did the person know, did they not know, and the way our nation operates when it comes to HIV positive, you don't get um, a secrecy about yourself because it is a communicable disease. It is life impacting and it can be devastating. Um, we have to address it. So it isn't a matter of like you not ever like contacting us. We actually will try to find any way to get in touch with the individual. Do you know what I mean? To address it and then also let their local health authority know mm. about this individual. Because the goal is to get them treatment so that, you know, they can eventually under treatment become undetectable. That's the, ho the whole focus. But people kind of don't necessarily um, think about that. And the reason why I say that is because I didn't know until I started reading into it this weekend about how individuals who are positive, whether they know it or don't, and then they donate blood, like um, that they actually look at the data and the person says that they are not positive and that they have not been with another, they have not had sex with the person who is, you know, that is a man that has had sex with other men within the time frame. So thereby they should be cleared and yet that's not the case. So you have to do a whole lot of like um, historical like backtracking when a person comes up positive because you have to determine like how they became to, you know, how they zero converted and became positive, like and what the event was. Um, was uh -huh. it, you know, IV injection? Was it a contaminated needle? Um, you know, Jeff, you are right that a lot of tattoo shops have, you know, moved into compliance because a lot of them have now come under jurisdictions of um, local health or state health departments in terms of licensing and sanitation because it is considered a um, like the toppest level of a medical invasive kind of thing, like because you are puncturing the skin and doing something to the body. Uh, where that wasn't necessarily the case in the past. So there's a ton of stuff behind that. Um, before we get into the, the three-month thing, I was kind of wondering, Damon, like your thoughts, because um, I didn't want to like skip you on that. Well, um, I am in the camp of um, this is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, just, to, you know, I'm, I'm in the camp of like, you know, it, it it's, I have, you know, I don't have, again, I don't have a lot of knowledge, but the things I do understand is that, you know, there are many reasons why, I understand why, but I feel like we can, not to be, we could move past this, because it's, because, you know, it is not just men who have sex with men that are HIV positive or any other STIs or infections. Um, also, on top of that, there are a lot of things that we do now, you know, prep, you know, all these, you know, sex education things that are in place. There are medications that can make someone undetectable for years. You know, there are all these avenues and 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 um, you know, testing and what have you that can be done. That it does. I don't feel that this ban is necessary. Mm -hmm. And if it were a ban, because I was reading in the article, there is the ban of women who have sex with men who have sex with men. Mm -hmm. Like that's part of it as well. They were also banned, you know, if they know, just kind of be, you know, down low is a thing. Just saying. I, I <laughs> wait for that to come up in today's show because I was like, because that's mm -hmm. a reality. Yeah, about... I think. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of where my mind is at. Like there's, while I understand 
I understood the questions in the 80s when we were unsure about any of this and there was no, you know, um, understanding of how this is spread and blah, 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 and, and everything. We're, we're now, what, almost 30 years past that? And over 30 years past that, and this is now still a thing that it's, it is a, it is a, something that is preventing people from donating, mm -hmm. essentially, like to be, to, to put it like that it is essentially preventing people from donating who could potentially donate. Um, I am, if I remember correctly, and it's been years, I believe I'm O negative or O positive. I can't remember. So I'm one of those universal donors. I could potentially donate and save lives. Like I, cause my blood can be used universally, but I can't donate. And, you know, up until actually, yeah, up until, you know, when 2015 hit, I still couldn't donate. And now here we are 2020, I still can't donate. Even though I'm on prep, I get tested every three months. I, I, you know, I'm doing my personal best to prevent infection of my body and spread a disease. I still can't donate because I still engage in sex with men. And that's where I think that's where the other side of it is. It's, it's not a matter of, I understand like the disease isn't potentially there, but the, the matter to me is that you're denying me the ability to donate because of who I sleep with, but you don't deny the, you know, the woman who could, it could, you know, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be blunt about this. The woman who spreads her legs for any Tom, Dick and Harry and John and William that comes her way. You know, that's where, you know, those are kind of my situations. Those are my thoughts, you know, where it seems that way. And, and if it's again, if it is, this is me as a layman, if there is more information out there, I'll gladly take it and process it. But for me right now, this does not feel like enough. Like, cause there are multiple people out there doing multiple things and having sex with other people and, and potentially spreading disease are not spreading disease. And they're still capable are able to donate. But if I mark a box that says I've had sex with a man in the past three months, I'm denied, even though I take care of myself. I'm on things to prevent spread of disease. I get mm -hmm. tested every three months. You know, those are those are the things that are where I am. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem fair mm -hmm. to me. It's not. And to while be, I can respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I mean, I, I cheer for the fact that there's progression. Uh, I, I know that it's not it's not there yet. Where people who are going to be donating blood should be responsible enough to have already considered all these measures. They've been tested recently. They know they're clear. Uh, they, they've, they've got blood that... that to give they're willing to give it um and in they have that responsibility and i it, part of this is, i think is the the initial regulation got in place uh because people were freaking out uh of something and and nowadays it's still we're still at a place while things have have progressed a lot in the past 40 years almost uh, 30 40 <laughs> 35 40 years um, it's still not there with just in general uh, discrimination for uh, the LGBT community and especially when they're thinking that uh, many of sex men are more in danger of these sort of sort of situations that they're trying to be as cautious and they're a little more paranoid when the science and, and trust in the people who are willing to give blood um, they are, 
is uh, is there, and especially when they've already taken the appropriate precautions, that they should there shouldn't be a restriction. Um, and I think that's that's uh, I mean they should have have the the questionnaire should say have you been tested within the past three months, and if you've been tested in the past three months, it doesn't matter how soon you've had sex with men you can still you can still get bullet that sort of thing where it's not necessarily about having the sex but about knowing your status that would be the more of an ideal of it especially if they want to have have the concern these if they have these type of concerns and but those the the conservatives are just they're still pushing back on it uh, and we're not there yet but we have progressed which is a a win it's a, it's like we win the battle but not the war mm -hmm. and it's trying to look at it in different points of view so i think i think everything that everyone's saying is valid and i agree with you damon like from your viewpoint when you say like uh, like why is it not why why do we have a 90 day window why the three months why when i'm getting tested um q actually after the coldr on uh thursday night i had kind of said to you like i was curious about the whole u equals u factor and how that works with blood donation um so actually i found out since then if you are on truvada or discovi uh for prep as an hiv negative person but is technically considered a high risk negative person and the reason the hrnp becomes a label is because the behaviors exhibited mean that you're putting yourself at risk mm -hmm. so individuals like and i know that i'm not saying that this is right just as clarification because i feel like i'm going to be representing a whole bunch of stuff that <laughs> people are going to disagree with and that's fine because i'm not going to say that i agree with them i'm just going to state them mm -hmm. um the best individual who is uh, least at risk for HIV is the person who is abstinent, full stop. That being said, I'm no fool. Like Q, you and I discussed this. Men, men, men want to procreate. You know, mm -hmm. like they want to, they want to get the seed out there because biologically, mm -hmm. genetically, that's how we are formulated. You know, to make more, make more, make more, make more, make more. Hence, you know, people are like tugging and pulling and baiting and you know all sorts of things baiting <laughs> uh, baiting and switching and uh, wait 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 no that's that yep. that's <laughs> well, that's the thing. um <clears throat> so the individual who is sexually active therefore moves up the the ranking of like risk an individual who uh, has more partners moves up in terms of risk if the individual is not using precautions, they move up. Like, like all of that becomes exponentially part of the, the key mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Um, and while, yes, we, the four of us, can perhaps see ourselves as educated individuals who know how to take care of ourselves and are doing things to be, you know, uh, take precautions, it does not mean that the lay public is. There is no guarantee that everyone out there is educated, let alone, like, taking any type of universal precaution at all. And that's where I think mm -hmm. things get a little complicated because you have to, you have to policy for the most part is enacted based on the, the least compliant individual, if that makes sense. So like we don't put these things into place to protect the people who are who already know better, we put it mm -hmm. in place to protect the people who don't know better or refuse to like abide by whatever the you know I mean sciences. Go ahead. Fact. No, so just fact, 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 the fuck fact there. <laughs> like, just as we're dealing with this, you know, pandemic and there are people like congregating like all over the fucking place. Like that's you know, just you know, that's I I get it. And I get that. And that's kind of, that puts a little like, oh, okay. So this isn't for me, the knowledge, you know, taking care of my fucking self, you know, person. This is for the guy that isn't 
where it isn't doing protection, isn't taking prep, isn't, you know, and going out there and doing whatever, maybe, you know, higher, higher risk because they're, you know, taking drugs and all that stuff. Like they're there. That's kind of what you're thinking, right? Like, well, right. There's, there's a, there's a key factor in like, you can have awareness, but like I've told people like <laughs> over the past couple of years, it's be kind of become a thing as I got older, which I guess I've known it, but it isn't until it's verbalized people can understand or be willing to accept is to explain to folks just because somebody knows better doesn't mean they do better. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, sure. and your mm-hmm. key like representation of that is addiction. So like people who have addiction to substance or behavior, they may very well know that what they're doing is wrong and they still do it anyways. So they will still drink, they will still shoot, they will still snort, mm-hmm. they will still fuck, they will still eat, they will, you know, abuse themselves in whatever way because to them it is their coping mechanism. It is how mm-hmm. they operate with something. Mm-hmm. And men, I'm going to make a really broad brush statement, men do not know how to deal with their hormones in like probably productive ways and productive is with air quotes only because like when you are genetically driven to just make more and that's really what, you know, species wise happens across many different, you know, kind of um, groupings. It's challenging because we haven't determined like what that should be or could be Um, society wise. We haven't said, you know what? Q, you go ahead and you yank one out every single day. And then here's the way you should handle that. Like, here's what you should do with it after the fact. Like, so everybody finds their own, you know, mechanism. You'll find, like, when it comes to online media, some people are into, you know, showing off that they swallow their own, you know, bodily fluids. And others, you know, save it. And they, I don't know, they make all sorts of things from cocktails to cookbooks to like, you know, sorry, Damon. (laughs) 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 That's, I mean, it's true. People will, I mean, it's all up on the Twitter, you know, people will show their little um, canister full of cum that they've been collecting, you know, from other men. Waiting for that one day to just. <laughs> mm. <laughs> We're losing David. He's like, <laughs> he's going to check out. Um, Ooh, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> but yeah. So, yeah. Because, so because we societally like don't really have a cohesive messaging agreement, um, whatever you want to call it, like on how mm-hmm. that how that is to be dealt with. Uh, I took to horribly misquote. What is it? Jurassic Park. Life will find a way. Yeah. Um, you know, men do what men do. So they will, no offense, fuck anything. And I mean anything. Like, mm-hmm. the toy industry has exploded over the past, like, I'd say five years because it's an outlet. It's a thing. Mm-hmm. And if it's mm-hmm. stimulating and exciting and whatever, like, great. But, yep. like, that's helpful mm-hmm. in a way as opposed to a person yeah. because that's kind of what it comes down to. Like, you know, I think about how in... um even within areas of the U.S., let alone outside of the U.S. and other countries where mm-hmm, sex mm-hmm. sex doesn't have meaning if it is just getting off. And that's a significant challenge for people who, who equate sex with some measurement of making love. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different ballgame. Two yep. men hooking up in a, in a semi-public space to come is not sex. Like it is, but it may not necessarily be intercourse and it's not usually about making love and you can see it in the body language. Like of the individuals, there is not a whole lot of contact. There is not there is not an exchange of information. Like like <laughs> I don't even like I don't ask your name. I don't have any information based on you. Like I may not even look at you. You might and you would not because... know how you might not even be able to put, pick that person out of a lineup cuz you don't even mm-hmm. recognize their face. Like Mhm. Right. And it's not because like, I mean, what factor could be that you're so repulsed by your own behavior, but the reality is like, you don't want to have a connection with the other person. Mm -hmm. They are, but an outlet for what you're going through. And, you know, I've, I made an article recently for a local newsletter about the fact that 
MSM, you know, are really in a struggle right now under the COVID-19 pandemic because we created mechanisms and pathways for us to be able to deal with our stress and anxiety and our depression Mm -hmm. a la apps um, to be able to hook up with other guys because when you have sex, you get this flood of hormones. So, and those hormones do a lot for our health and our well being in some ways. And so they can help mitigate your depression and your anxiety and, you know, your, um, psychological well being in terms of how you feel about yourself. And if you, you know, if you have self worth or if you're attractive, I mean, it gets very complicated, but because of all that to be said, when it comes to donating blood and HIV, it gets really complicated because people, no offense, they don't recognize some of that stuff. Like they don't, they don't imagine um, hooking up with someone in the neighborhood on the DL as mm-hmm. being MSM or that it's even sex. You know, mm-hmm. it's just my buddy helping me out. Okay, well, yeah. your buddy was receiving. You're seven and a half thrusting inches, okay? So that's actually intercourse, whether you want to admit it or not. Yeah. And that's what I mean about, like, education and and recognition and stuff. And so that all being said, the science is um, when it comes to testing, there's different types of tests that are available out there. Um, There are what are called third-generation and fourth-generation tests rapid tests and then we also have self testing kits when it comes to HIV. So I'm going to I'm going to make some statements and I'm going to make a uh, presumption so it's completely possible I want to be wrong on this but Damon when you were talking about like the prep that you're going through and about the 3 months you're probably doing a, a rapid test of some sort or a self test kit. Yeah. Um so, well so you were I I been well I've been going through I go I I've got prep now through my doctor. So, okay. well, yeah, my primary treating physician, which is part of a um, HIV um, organization. So it's kind of related to that. It's not a like um, like a beta test or anything. This is actually like there's a doctor in the office that comes in and I go to them like a regular doctor. But on top of it, it's part of the bigger umbrella of the organization. Right. Um, I've talked about it before, Caracol. So, um, I get tested through, um, blood, urine, and all the other, like when I first went in, they did a full test of all STIs cause you have to, right. and that included taking blood and urine and, and samples from the throat and whatnot. Um, since then, Actually, I was due to do, I did it in January. Was that just a rapid? I think that was just a rapid. No, no, they took blood. Never mind. Back that. Sorry. <laughs> Scratch that. I had to go get blood taken. So they take blood, but they just did that that time. So. so the reason why I ask is because all these different types of tests have different windows for detection. They also are looking for different things, whether it be antibodies or the antigens. Um, mm-hmm. When they appear in the blood supply, in sorry, not blood supply, in your own blood, um, to be detectable is a different window of time. So, mm-hmm. and then the reliability of that test is also a factor. So, there's a lot of things that come about. So, if you do at home testing, rapid testing, um, self testing, All of those pretty much have a three months after exposure window, meaning it can take up to three months before the test will actually come up positive. When that happens, you will immediately be referred to go get more testing. You will get a more definitive test. Um, You will most likely move into what we call the fourth generation test for antibody and antigen, um, which is more thorough. And Mm -hmm. I hate to say this, but the more recent tests that are more specific cost more money Mm -hmm. and that's a part of the whole factor behind this is that well yes all of the blood is tested that gets donated no matter where it is the testing that's done is typically with the most recent stuff but when you think of it from an effectiveness measure if we allowed 100 percent of the population to donate no matter what and then we had to test 100 percent of that blood and yet we know x times out of all of those there's going to be these issues that come up in the blood supply and therefore make the blood non-usable, then 
what are we doing with all of that cost for all mm-hmm. of that testing? Right. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, that's, that's one and, aspect yeah. of it. Go ahead. I was going to say that really makes sense to me. I mean, um, most things in life, really, when you're involving businesses, it you know, it uh, or nonprofits or whatever, a lot of it really comes down to money. What is the money issue? So, I can understand that that point makes sense to me. Um, yeah. So, if it does come can down, come down to a money issue and recognizing that having a three month window will help to kind of really mitigate the costs of of the testing in All general. Of the testing. If, yeah, then that that makes sense to me. I can understand that. Right. And so one of the other things to be aware of is that um, most people, but not all, about 97% will develop the detectable antibodies within three to 12 weeks. So that's 21 to 84 days. So that's where our three-month figure keeps coming into play. Mm-hmm. While, yes, technically you could detect um, HIV within as little as 10 days, that's depending on the test and that's depending on your body. And this is where people probably don't want to deal with this. It's no different than COVID-19. How you exhibit symptoms, how your body reacts is individual to you. So if you get exposed to something, it's very specific to your body makeup. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be tuberculosis. It could be HIV. It could be COVID-19. It could be influenza. Um, could be rhinovirus for the common cold. It doesn't matter. Everybody's body, everybody's immune system reacts differently. Do you have what we call comorbidities? Do you have other factors that already are suppressing or causing um, an imbalance within the body's natural systems? And that also plays a factor. So I think it would be great in a simplistic black and white world to be like, okay, the moment HIV enters the body, it does this, this, and this, and therefore your body signs will be this, this, and this. And on day X, like we just know emphatically, no matter what it's there, Mm -hmm. HIV is not that fun. It's actually quite troublesome. And that's because it likes to hide within varying tissues of the body. Mm. One current theory that's being studied is bone marrow is its last reservoir of of, of uh, hide because individuals wow. who are HIV positive that take medicines, they can test negative. They can test like zero um, cultures within the body, like no replications, no viral load, CD4 counts great. And they'll go for the longest time and then out of the blue – Bam. Like it'll just appear like overnight, not literally Mm -hmm. overnight, but like unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And the theory is now, wait a second. Like if we were doing all this testing and you came kept coming up with like almost all like, you know, great numbers, then where the hell was it? So because it's nefarious and it does this hiding business in the body, it can be a little complicated. And so while individuals are on prep for, um, being, uh, undetectable well not that's uh, more uh differently but anyways like the the concept is just because you are taking things to prevent infection doesn't mean that you aren't which is a little dicey because i think what people don't understand is not not everything's 100 percent. so the medicines are not 100 percent. like condoms are not 100 percent. um you know as we all probably well know pulling out is not 100 percent. uh <laughs> you know i mean there's just there's so much possibility of exposure that makes it challenging so yeah be- because of the time periods that it takes for an, an infection to appear sure it could be as little as seven to ten days so I, I can understand some people would be like oh well if it's as little as two weeks like why don't we just like test why don't we change the limitation from three months to further and that's a good idea there's nothing wrong with that what i found uh stupendously amazing was um in the materials that are online, actually with the FDA, there's a public document that I've listed, which is the meeting notes from March of 2019, a year ago, where um, Blood Products Advisory Committee had this meeting in White Oak Campus, Silver Springs, Maryland. The FDA actually had a discussion a year ago about this very issue. Like, can we make changes to the blood supply? Like, how Mm -hmm. it's limited, that type of stuff. This says to me that this has never gone away. It has always kind of been in a discussion. It's been studied. But moving the the goal or whatever is 
been the bigger factor. Like, where do we think it's safe for the blood supply and for everything else that comes up with it, the monitoring system and how it can be utilized? And because the questions and the forms are um, a way to funnel who can donate, mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of trust and reliability that people self um kind of remove them i can't remember mm -hmm. what the is, but they they you know uh go through this process and say oh because of this i can't do that like and you know we had kind of discussed a little bit earlier like i didn't even know even though i probably should have because it makes logical sense people who got tattoos were part of that situation so in 2015 when they changed it to 12 months if you had had a tattoo you had to go a whole year before you could actually donate blood same thing with piercing i don't i don't know that um because there's there's not enough of a system set in place to give us absolutes. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'll, I'll ask you this, Q, because I can see both of us have our ears pierced. Mine are covered up with my headphones right now. Did you go, like, to a licensed place? Do you know if the, who and how and when you did that, if that could be documented and reportable when you get your ears pierced? Um, I'm pretty sure it can be documented. So, yeah, I went to uh, probably one of the more well-known licensed piercing professionals in the city of Columbus. Okay. So the reason I ask is because I went to a tattoo shop where I actually got my ears pierced um, because that was a thing I found out. I didn't know that, like, where I grew up at, like, most everybody I knew had not great stories to tell about this place called the Piercing Pagoda. No offense to them. Um which was a, a kiosk shop in the mall. And that was pretty much where a lot of people went and everyone told horror stories about how they have this gun and sometimes it doesn't, it isn't effective and you know, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, I was kind of wanted to get my ears pierced, but I waited until I was 30 and I was like, okay, this is going to be my 30th year thing that I do. But I had found out from friends of mine, they were like, oh, well tattoo shops, some of them do piercing. And I was like, really? I was like, well, that's intriguing. And then I got educated on how, their piercing is different. It is not necessarily a gun. It's actually done with a hollow needle. So when it pierces, it is not making a hole. It is literally punching out <laughs> a hole in your earlobe, taking a whole chunk out and everything. Um, Ooh. Which, uh, mm hmm. Mm. So, you know, it, it's different and um, it's meant to be, you know, a little bit more clinical and, you know, they use a sterile set and all this kind of stuff. And you could find out which shops would do it. So I went to a place that, to my own question to you, theoretically, you know, as much as I know of was licensed. I saw something in a frame on the wall. I did not closely examine it. I did not try to look it up on the Internet. So I trusted within that system. But I know many people who have done home tattooing and home piercing. So many people. I'm I'm shocked at the amount of people that have told me that they do this. And I'm like, okay, hey, it's your body. Do do your thing. But no, no, ma'am, no, I could not do that. <laughs> no, I don't trust myself to do those things to pierce my body. Or no, I could never. No, right. <laughs> and so, like the fact that. We don't have the ability to know authentically when someone gets a tattoo or someone gets pierced, whether or not it was at a facility that is licensed and can be trackable and reportable. That's part of the complication why in the limitations, it's like, okay, how far back in time do we know that we could detect a possible infection? Like I have literally been in a home, which I'm not... I'm not going to say I'm ashamed to say this, but I'm not proud of it. I have been in a home and observed someone who is not licensed with their own tattoo gun give tattoos to multiple people like it was kind of like a house party. Oh, God. Yeah. Now, to be fair, <laughs> they did use different mm -hmm. needles, but I would not say that the kitchen in someone's <laughs> home is the most hygienic, ideal atmosphere. Nope. What? No. Mm. But, this <laughs> no. <laughs> but this stuff happens, you know? Oh, yeah. And oh, I for asked, sure. You know, did I want a tattoo? And I was like, nope, I'm good. Because <laughs> I made a call in that moment. I was like, nothing against this person, but I just don't want you 
giving me my tattoo. I had also been for many years and still to this day want a tattoo, but I want something very unique. I want something very specific that I am going to take ownership of because no offense, bitch is going on my body and it will be there till I die. So I'm not, you know, in college, I was amazed by how many people were just like, oh, I got drunk. I went and I got this thing, you know, and it's like, so I see tramp stamps and I see Tweety Birds and I see butterflies. Like I see all this shit and I'm just kind of like, okay. Like there's a part of me that's like, y'all realize that's for life. Technically, yes, you can have it removed for some coin and some pain, um, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, someone that I work with, I found out actually for a side job for a number of years, did tattoo removal um, mm-hmm. at a tattoo shop. Like I was a, one thing that the tattoo shop also supplied. Not that people, not that they regretted their <laughs> tattoos there, but like, like <laughs> looking at it, be like, uh, no. Like, can we? Right. Can, can I go over here and get like? Get this. Yeah. I don't want this anymore. <laughs> yeah, and, and sometimes people, you know, they make decisions and then later they may not stick by that decision. Like they put somebody's name on them. Mm-hmm. You know, how classic is it? You see a heart with a ribbon across it and it has someone's name. Well, this is my one true love, blah, 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 blah. And this is my spouse or this is my partner. This is the person I married. And then y'all get divorced. Mm-hmm. So that was know, straight so- up uh, Tiger King, one of his men had this like, had something tattooed like just above. Just below his belly button, and mm-hmm. uh, once they divorced, he um, kind of covered it up with some other. He covered up the words with some. Um, I forget what, uh, but he covered it up with some sort of uh, artwork. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. So instead of trying to get rid of it, he just covered it up a little bit more. But yeah, yeah. you're right. People, you know, say they're in love and just do whatever. You do. This is this is why write all the things, advise. and I'm like, ooh, girl, okay, good luck. This is why I always advise: don't put names as a tattoo. Just, just, just avoid it. Symbolism, mm-hmm. sure, because you could always uh, adjust the meaning. Yeah, I can now, see. I will say but, so. But, I have I have one tattoo, and it is a name, and it's the name of my mom, and it's mm-hmm. near my heart. So, mm-hmm. so um, that's yeah. yeah, that is you know for me, there, I, there, I won't ever get rid of that. Um, there are appropriate names, you know, there are, there are appropriate names, but that sometimes that loved one, that's not like a family or blood relation or, or a dear, fr- like I, my, my brother has gotten tattoos of dear friends who have passed on kind of thing. Okay. Like mm-hmm. those kind of things, those I can respect and understand, but like there are times when I'm like, mm, maybe not so much, but again, your body, your choice. I'm not going to shame you, but like when you let's let's wait a while, like maybe we've been together for several years and we going to be together for a while, like, right. <laughs> not within like five months. Oh, I love him. Oh my God. I can't, I, I would never, I want him to be as close to me as possible. So I'm going to put no, and then no, like that. No, but right. And there's something to be said for, you know, branding. That's a whole other thing. Like Mm -hmm. sometimes that becomes a part of like tattoo culture and that like, so, you know, and and I know somebody who I'm directly um, connected to that I care for very much that like after putting a spouse's name on them, turned around and had another tattoo as a cover up done um, strategically. And I was like, okay. I was like, did you tell them about that? They were like, no. And I was like, all right. And then eventually that person found out because after the separation, after the divorce, they were better off that way. Um, mm-hmm. Only, you know, when you take your shirt off and their presence, because it's hot out, like you're cutting the grass mm-hmm. or something. You're like, oh, um, yeah. What, what's going on there? <laughs> why, why is there a bullet hole where there used to be a heart with a thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So. So yeah. that all that being said is a kind of a divergence of topic, you know, um, like the, it makes sense to be why, you know, there are these varying groupings um, about risk and factor, uh, mm-hmm. you know, is has the person, um, you know, exchanged sex for money or drugs? Have they, you know, had an event in which, uh, you know, non prescription injection drug use took place, uh, you know, and. Have they been exposed to a person that they know is positive or done any of those uh, particular things? Um, Have they been a recipient of a transfusion? 
So there's a lot of stuff that actually changed when this announcement got made. We are focusing on the MSM aspect because I think that was the part that was the most attention drawing was like, oh, mm-hmm. have have you not had sex with anybody for 90 days or more? Guess what? You can donate blood. You don't have to wait a whole year. Um, so I, I hear and I clearly understand because I'm thinking about how we've been doing this podcast for quite a while and we did not discuss when December of 2015 rolled around and it changed from indefinite to 12 months for a limitation, we did not have a discussion about like, Oh, Mm -hmm. any of y'all like not had sex for a year with another man. Cause you could donate. Like that was just, yeah. I think the, the belief was get real. Like how much of the population is not having sex for a year plus. Yeah. I can honestly say that I don't remember that. December 2015 announcement. Mm-hmm. I remember. I didn't. I didn't know that until I read this article, this early yeah. April article. I was like, "Oh, yeah. I didn't. Re- I it had no idea." Yeah. I, still, I remembered I it. Being... Been, I still would have been ineligible, but I didn't. But I had no idea. Right. Yeah. So I remembered that that changed because, like this one, there was a lot of feedback about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that had more to do with the fact that it had taken. 30 years right from yeah from from indefinite ban to within a like a year kind of thing so that's 30 years of time and that was the main issue back then one of the main issues was that it's been 30 years you know why are we doing this so why are we doing this now this could have been done 10 years ago five you know whatever kind of thing Um, right and and part of the answer to the like why things are happening when they're happening has somewhat to do with testing, like mm-hmm. the advancements in testing and the ability to have those things when third generation and fourth generation testing came about, um, because those classifications, how they test, determine what's being done. So as just to everybody know or is going to be aware, third generation HIV testing is antibody testing. So it's actually looking for the body to have developed reaction to Mm -hmm. hiv to try to fight it um Mm -hmm. so you know the the idea is is that you know there that something's happening and we're trying to combat it um the difficulty uh, also that people may not be aware of is that prior to testing coming up positive you're considered acute um in your infection which is when you're the most like likely to pass it on to other people Mm mm-hmm so it's really challenging because the testing is not accurate and thorough enough to catch it ASAP, you know, like as in within hours or a day mm-hmm. or two. And thereby, it becomes more of an issue because while you're still waiting to be able to go get a test, you could theoretically be passing it on, which loops mm-hmm. back to why the messaging is, you know, safer, you know, precautious stuff. You know, that's why when we talk about prep overall, doesn't matter, you know, what you're taking, it's not 100%. Please still mm-hmm. use a condom. Like, you know, um, be aware of the activities that you're taking. Know the sexual health history of the other person that you're with. I mean, there's all these things. Yeah. And and I get it. Like, I'm, I've been on the other fence. I've been on the other side of, like, in the moment, I am not ready to put – hit pause on the recorder – and have, you know, a five to ten minute breakdown discussion, you know, all this stuff about, like, you know, what's your history and what do you do and when was the last time you were with somebody and da 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 da, da. Like, while it is adult and mature and completely understandable that you would do it, that is not how people tend to operate. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. Yeah, it's like, I yeah, I, I mean, for me, you know, when I go to bathhouses or do whatever, um, you know, outdoor play I do, um, you know, it's like, um, I just, uh, I just assume that everyone is positive. And I am on PrEP as well. I'm on Discovery. And so um, I just go, even though I don't know your name, I know that penis um, so for me, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, it's, it's managing the risk, you know? And so I think that's, yeah, it isn't, it is, I, I hope we get to a point where, um, and hopefully this coincides with, um, the, uh, the blood ban finally kind of lowering its time from three months to whatever it's going to be. I hope it mm-hmm. coincides with, 
um, the HIV testing, being able to either identify antibodies sooner than three months, or if they're, if they're not going to do that, uh, you said that third wave testing, if they're able to somehow detect that you have it. I just hope that that slowly, when we have better testing, we're able to finally really mm-hmm. close that gap, you know, because yeah. um, three months is difficult. It is, it is a difficult time of that well, wondering so- and pondering and all that stuff. So and, one, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, uh, go ahead because I'm gonna I'm going into the chat a little bit. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, so the, one of the things I was gonna say is like there's a fourth generation test which is antibody and antigen. So it's actually looking for the antibodies in our own immune system in our blood supply, and it's looking for viral proteins from HIV. That test, which is the most recent version and is understandably the most expensive, can detect approximately one month after exposure. So if, let's say, we were to move to where that is the test that's used universally and applied, then possibly we could reduce the three-month limitation down to two months, six weeks. Like, Mm -hmm. we can help close the window, but we're still going to have that gap. We are, no matter what, until we get a definitive um, test that can detect it, like, uh, you know, and that's part of the issue is like the So, I mean, I kind of think about this in terms of COVID-19. Uh, my coworkers and I have had discussions about like how people can be asymptomatic or mildly mm-hmm. symptomatic. And we don't know what the replication is like. We, like COVID-19 is so new. We don't know enough about it scientifically. And it takes months. It takes, you know, a long time to to study and to develop and to get it to do things. And, you know, some viruses do not replicate well in like a, you know, uh, artificial environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they don't want to play nice and they don't want to replicate in the little agar, you know, plastic disc in a a laboratory, then you need live cultures, which becomes even more problematic when you have people who are, you know, politically on this, you know, stance of like, oh, you're not allowed to use like real human cells and blah, blah, blah. So that, you know, and then you got to use animal cells and then, you know, people, you know, who are affiliated in certain groups, perhaps Peter or whatever, like you can't do that with animals. I mean, it's like. So there's this whole complexity of like how yeah. you address virology and testing and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, until we get to the point where we have something uh, much more like quicker, like effective that can point things out where we're not waiting for a certain replication, like goal line to be passed before a test can pick up something like we're we're actually kind of in the right spot in terms of. The amount of time I didn't know yeah. that though like I had to learn that through my job and through like reading up on stuff of late um, mm-hmm. when it comes to that so it's not unrealistic in terms of the science and the study portion of it but I absolutely understand from the other perspective where you know we have to say to MSM be like when was the last time you fuck was it more than three months ago <laughs> you know yeah in order to be able to 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 donate go ahead you know. David they ask it that way though it sounds more casual (laughs) yeah yeah well trust me when it comes to government forms and that kind of stuff there's nothing casual about it it is all very anyways i got i got problems with that and i'll say that for another time (laughs) (laughs) so uh the first thing is for there's one there's two things from birdie i'll start with the first one it it mentions does it not come does well does it not come across as simply a gay problem um he says i believe in closed versus uh open relationships you may have less of a chance sleeping with men as opposed to a man um must increase the risk so um this is for um the first thing to just kind of get the clinical thing um the ban right now is for gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. So the idea being that it is a, um, it can come across as a gay problem because as I was mentioning in the beginning, like these kind of regulations aren't necessarily attributed to women who have, you know, sex with women, women who have, have sex with men, um, men who have sex with women, you know, w- who all are potentially susceptible to catching HIV or any other sexually transmitted, you know, infection. Like those, that that's there. But right. as Gary has kind of mentioned, um, this is all about risk factor, and we know, we know that 
men who have sex with men, and this is again kind of really being a little blunt, uh, men who have sex with men are at a higher risk of catching HIV STIs because of their behaviors. Right, and it, and it also the the restriction, although it's listed separately, uh, there is a restriction. The same restriction for women who have sex with men who have sex with men. Yeah. Right. So, it, like, that's an important factor is, like, out of the ten, like, items, the last one says, defer for three months from the most recent sexual contact a female who has had sex during the past three months with a man who has had sex with another man in the past three months. Which mm -hmm. goes back to earlier in the podcast where we were like, like, really? Who knows that? Like, yeah. Sometimes they don't. They not don't not everyone is fluid and open. Yeah. about their about right. their sexual history and their partner's sexual history like mm -hmm. i i i live i admit i live in a bubble i know people who are very open so i know women that are aware of their partner's sexual history and would have mm -hmm. that information but that's like yeah very small like it's not very yeah. big we know we you know those of us especially those of us in like the kink communities and whatever we know of these um cuckold these cu these couples that are very sexually fluid and very sexually open and understand that their partner may have desires or needs that they are not able to fulfill. Like we, 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 we are, we are knowledge of these things. And some of these couples have that understanding and are very open and honest with each other about who they're having sex with and who, you know, you know, whatever on that same token, there are couples that are absolutely not. And that goes across the board, right? You know, there are there are we know of. I'm sure we could all have, we all have stories like we know of committed male, you know, male male relationships that are going out and doing other things without the knowledge of their partner. Mm -hmm. Like we know these, and is it is it is it is it is it right? Is it fair? No. But again, this is why as we've kind of been learning through this episode, there are regulations and rules against kind of these things as we're learning, you know, as my so, duet partner would say, communication is key. Yeah. Um, so here's where the ugly hard truth in the numbers doesn't help us as MSMs. Mm -hmm. And this, this is, is where I was going, but go ahead. So this is, this is the thing that is problematic. So in 2018, which is the most recent full year that we have numbers for 37,832 people in the U S were diagnosed with HIV. These are new like, uh, individuals. Okay. When you break down these numbers from the CDC for the transmission category, male to male sexual contact is the highest of all the new cases mm -hmm. to the tune of 27 or sorry, 24,909 of the cases, which is 69%. Uh -huh. So more than two thirds of all new HIV cases, individuals are MSM contacts. Uh -huh. So I'm going to say it like this, and this is going to be really probably un unpopular and I get it. We did it to ourselves because we, because we fuck, because we do things and we don't take precaution because we're not on prep, because we're not using condoms, because we're not educated, because we're not aware, whatever the thing is, we are the largest population percentage of new cases of hiv mm -hmm. by far end of story and that is the reason why no offense we're not trusted yeah it's the reason why the regulations are there like that's to you know and you know breaking it down that way it gives me a little bit personally a, a little bit more understanding does it mean i'm still in agreement with it not necessarily but that's where my mind goes mm -hmm. like okay you look at the facts and that's where, you, like you said, Gary, like they look at the facts and they make the decisions based on the facts. Like we can do all of these things in the world or in the United States. I'll just keep it like that. Keep it simple. We can do right. all these things here. We can push like condom usage and prep and Descovy and, and, and Truvada and getting tested and all of that stuff. You can push it out there, but we're still seeing it happening because some men can't keep the dick out of their mouth or, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know it, 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 it's the truth. And right. that's what it's seeing. So therefore to reflect on that, 
these things have to be put in place. Again. So, uh, and I was going to say that, uh, and this kind of goes into a larger conversation about health education in general, because I think, and maybe Gary can look up, look up the numbers, that not only are the majority of cases by men who have sex, sex with men, but it is men of color who have the highest um, uh, kind of percentage of the men who are having sex with men. And in terms of men of color, um, there's a lot of that is just a lack of education. So um, in their neighborhoods and their cities and not being able to and trust in um, doctors, trust in the health, the, the lack of education that they are getting. I think a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of these new cases are coming from that segment of the population that just doesn't have that feels like um, they're not being cared about anyway. And maybe a number of them may have situations that maybe they're in um, maybe unstable relationships. Maybe they're uh, maybe uh, they're in and out of jobs, or there's just situations as a whole with our economy and health that I think lend um, those numbers to be higher for men of color. So um, there's also this health education aspect of not really caring for the entire community. Mm. And you're not wrong. Like I had to look it up really fast and then do some quick math. Um, of the new HIV infections of 2018, the largest percentage are black African-American at 42% of the new cases in 2018 and Hispanics are 26.69%. Yeah. It's, so if you it, add both of those percentages, it's like, whoa. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like 69%. So 69% of all new HIV cases are within those communities of color. And just to kind of understand the really quickly, that's all that's male and female. That's all of the, the range. Correct. Just, I'm just putting, putting it out there. Cause yeah, I wanted to put that out there. Cause that's not, you know, it's 69% of all the cases of all the people. Right. And, and if you wanted to, we could calculate it further and say, okay, of that multiply that times the 69% of that, that gives you the MSM. Mm -hmm. roughly it's not an exact yeah. number but like then you could see where that comes from and that's yeah i mean and it's an excellent point that you bring up you know q where you're like you know communities of color people who do not have good health education and when or where they are or their background mm -hmm. are also a key factor yeah it's a thing um and then um like, I'm just going to put, the, like, Birdie kind of, he goes, okay, so, okay, you don't, um, what is this? Um, okay, you don't care to know their name, but are happy to share fluids with them and are wondering what the issue is, question mark, kind of thing. So, again, we've, we've, I think we've kind of discussed this a little bit, you know, um, for some men and women and what have you, um, especially men, the issue becomes, it is a matter of, you know, as Gary mentioned, it's in our kind of genetic code to get off, to procreate, to, you know, do what we need to do. And, you know, men who have sex with men are notorious. And, and I'm, you know, as one of those people are notorious for understanding the risk and throwing that risk to the wind because they want to or need to get off you know this is why there are cruising there's been cruising for many many years this is why there are bath houses and what have you you know around the world and around the, you know it's it's a thing it is right. a thing and we can't deny that that is a thing without understanding that there is, you know, again, that there, there are issues related to it. Again, it's the reason why, you know, this is in effect, why this ban is in effect. Like there are, there are people. Let, let me modify that. It, this is a restriction. Right. You know, I, I, I think ban means we can't at all. It's changed. It went from a ban to a restriction. 
because we can still get blood if these factors are are uh, in place. Correct. So, so if you haven't had sex in in three months, you're restricted from from doing it until that three months grace period. And there are lots of mitigating factors that can prevent you from giving blood. Period. Like you could be underweight, you could have high blood pressure low blood pressure Mm -hmm. like you could have medications like there's a a whole list of things that can prevent you but you are correct jeff that like we've technically moved from a blood ban at the end of 2015 into restrictions or limitations and those have changed and that was the whole point of this conversation i don't know how many people are educated to recognize exactly that point that we're no longer banned from giving blood we just have like qualifications to meet before we can donate Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I think I was gonna say yeah, and I think I think overall, I I just hope that uh, anyone who's either listening to the podcast or just reads an article uh, that is MSM just understands that, uh, like you're, Gary, you just mentioned that there are a number of mitigating factors. So mm-hmm. this isn't it's not like um, they're they're after the gays, you know. It's uh, the gays are ruining, you know. Um, you know, uh, being able to donate blood. It's like, there are a number of, there are a number of groups of people that may not be able to, um, Mm -hmm. this one segment of MSM who've had sex in three months are just one of the many groups that are not able to give blood. Right. Yeah. And one of the last things is we're kind of moving into wrapping up that I want to point out that I did not know until I read this article from the New York times that we're going to link, um, was that in November of last year, like just what, six months ago at this point now, mm-hmm. the American Red Cross called on the FDA to reduce the deferral period because it was already happening in Britain and Canada. So we're not leading here. We're following as a mm-hmm. nation. Mm. And I didn't know that till I read that in the article and like kind of skimmed over it the first time and then like reread it again. And then I was like, wait a minute, like. The American Red Cross, like which is kind of the major U.S. network of blood donation drives that happens in the country, they actually last year were already asking for what eventually happened. Mm-hmm. And this was pre-pandemic. So like and that's been one of the arguments that's come about for a long, long time is that, um, you know, individuals cannot donate blood, as it says in the article, um, it's quoted that. We could be talking about up to 11% of the population that identify as LGBT, you know, are not possibly able to donate blood. And I do not disagree at all with the viewpoint that it is shitty and shady as fuck that it takes a worldwide pandemic with, you know, people having to have stay in home orders and to avoid coming into contact with others for the needle, for the goal, whatever you want to say to get moved to be like, oh, yeah, we need we need blood. We're not getting hardly any blood or lots less blood. So like who who have we told they couldn't give blood? Now they can give, kind of. I get it. Like I, I don't disagree with that. Like mm-hmm. uh, that attitude that surprised me when I posted online it came right back at me. People were like, fuck them. I don't care. Too late. Blah 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 blah. And I was like, wait, whoa, hold it. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Like And I will own this, like, the reason that I probably got really excited about it is that I'm biased. Bitch, I now qualify. Like, my whole life till 2015, I never qualified to donate blood. Because I had had sex with another man once. Period. That's all it took was once. Until 2015 when it changed, and then you had to be abstinent for a year. I guess somewhere between 2015 and 2020, I could have qualified at some point for not having had sex with another man. Like, I don't really like, um, record that like in a black book diary of any sort. Like I don't Mm -hmm. really track, you know, when I get my free con, um, on a calendar. No Excel, no, no Excel spreadsheet. Uh, No, actually not. Um, (laughs) I'm saying it cause that's what I did at one point in time. Mm. Um, well, I have not like, I, I guess there are limitations to my Craigslist. Sky from um, Brawler. But that being said, it has been quite a while since I've been with a person. Um, so I know it's been 
more than three months because hello it's april 19th all you got to do is go back through three months to january like basically if you haven't done it with anybody since the new year you good like to be able to donate um there may be other factors that might prevent you but you know just on that one thing alone that limitation so i was i was excited because i was like i'm in my like mid going into my late fucking 40s and i feel like i can actually donate because the last time i could was technically when i was like 18 or 19 like because so much time had gone by Mm -hmm. um i didn't i didn't know when i was younger that i was about to lose the ability to donate blood simply because i had sex with another man like that was never explained nobody told me that and Mm -hmm. sure as fuck my partner probably didn't know slash tell me that you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like no one says to the other person, hey, now I know we're going to have some fun, but realize like once you do this, you can't you can't donate blood. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. it's crazy. Yeah. It's weird. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I took it very personal, like for the longest time, and I would campaign at my jobs uh, very unpopularly whenever they would say they would have a blood drive. Mm-hmm. And I would have to bring up and point out to the higher ups that make the decision that it is not fair to have a blood drive because they, that the practices of donating blood are discriminatory Mm -hmm. and that sometimes would go over. Okay. And sometimes it wouldn't, um, my longest career in telecom for what, 15 years, uh, we did blood drives very briefly in the beginning and then it came to a kibosh and it all stopped because uh, the messaging got through. We had enough of us as an employee base that consistently said as MSM, whether we were out or not, basically like, no, like we are prevented. We are discriminated against. We cannot give blood simply because of this one factor. And so it got real ugly and awkward because then the director had to say every year when they were approached, your practices are not equal, do not you know recognize equality and therefore we will not participate. So we would not have a blood drive. Um, and you can feel that way any way you want about it, but you know, as a as a way of using like politics to put pressure, was the concept behind that. Um, and so, to think that like this has changed and you don't have to be so political necessarily about it. Like I get it, three months is still not good. Knowing everything that I know right now, it's kind of optimal given the science that's out there. I do want it to get better. It would be stupendous if we could move it to two months. So six weeks something to make it a shorter time frame. But even so, I don't know how realistic that is. Like, well, right now it's realistic because everybody's supposed to be locked down. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm just ignoring all those like orgies that are going on supposedly online that I keep reading about and seeing stuff and keep on following people because they keep showing them fucking other people that are not their partners. Anyways, enough of that soapbox. So <laughs> just saying. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 it is a significant move. I think it's important, but I also wanted us to have this discussion so that people could, I think, get a more well-rounded understanding of it and then make decisions for themselves. If you qualify within that window, like it's been over three months since the last time you were with a person um, and you've had testing, you kind of know what your status is by all means. If you're interested and you want to, you should be able to look it up online, like either through, um, the Red Cross or through your local health department, something of that sort. No offense, just pick a internet search engine and type in blood donating. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, if you want to do that. And and even if you just want to do plasma, um, or you know, you even if you want to specifically do it for someone else that you care about, like there may be a circumstance in which someone you know needs blood donated, and if you have the type that they could get. Um, and you want it specifically to go to them, there's a there's most likely a path to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And that means that a door is now open that wasn't previously there. Like, I think of it this way. If my father needed blood and I had the ability to donate and give it to him without being limited now, like, I would willingly do that. Mm-hmm. That's that's part of where I think this comes from, part of my... Yeah, I mean, for me, I was going to say this is a great opportunity now that um, if someone knows a family member or a um or a friend who uh who needs blood and they can give blood now um this msm can a three you know waiting three months um is uh is doable 
waiting a year is a little bit difficult. So even if someone says today, you know what, my friend Tommy, I want to donate blood and give it to Tommy, I can I can hold off sex for three months and then be able to give, you know, Tommy blood versus a year. So I think it just gives us more opportunities for people who um, who want to donate blood can now, I think it's just manageable. I think three months is more manageable mm-hmm. than, uh, than 12 months. So um, now I think it gives us just more options, options to choose whether we want to do that or not. Mm-hmm. Right. Agreed. Hey, guess what? I think it's that time. I think we've talked this to death. Uh, so, during your quarantine, do a lot of baiting so that you can, after three months, you can give some blood, which is always good, just in general. Sometimes they pay you, which is even better. But that's just a bonus. Uh, uh, you're saving somebody's life. But in any case, I think that's the end. We got a bunch of links and a bunch of stuff in the show notes. Uh, which you'll be able to find over at CubsOutLoud.com. You can shoot us an email at CubsOutLoud at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 361-COL-TALK. That's 361-265-8255. You can find us in various social media outlets at CubsOutLoud in the appropriate place of the URL. That's Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and, of course, on YouTube. Uh, you can join our entourage chat at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. Uh, you can see when we're planning to do these shows live on our Google Calendar at tinyurl.com slash calendar dash col. You can get uh, merchandise such as uh, Consent is My Foreplay tank top that I'm wearing uh, or a uh, version 3 t-shirt that Gary's wearing or hat like Gary's wearing. Matching gray, dark gray, gray, light gray. It's nice. Uh, over at Zazzle.com com slash comes out loud and again if you're outside the united states you can go to your localization so sazzle.ca for canada etc uh, also at the bottom you can switch what country you're in to get local pricing and i believe shipment so it's cheaper uh, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash comes out loud uh, and if you uh, don't want to subscribe or don't really want need it to get or want to get some merchandise, you can go to paypal.me slash comes out loud uh, to give a one time donation. Uh, you can subscribe to us and rate us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, and Spotify. You can find me anywhere on the internet. It says box deck, box cubby, box cub, box something or other. If you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me as um, theatercub79 on most bear related sites, or you can find me as pup underscore umbra on Twitter. And if you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as Gabriel 73 You can also contact me, obviously, through the podcast here. Q. If people want to get in touch with you or have you touch them, perhaps, mm. at some point in the future. I mean, he's, he's, <laughs> All he's, a, right. he's a massage therapist, as you can see by the studio uh, name right above him. So that's how we could be. I got good hands. Okay. And that's uh, professional. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, but yeah, but if someone wants to get in contact with me, they can, uh, contact me on, uh, Instagram or Twitter under the handle Q's Massage Studio, QS Massage Studio, Facebook, it's under the same name. Uh, I also, um, which I didn't mention on the COLDR, I didn't mention that I also am the host of my own podcast called Queer Sacramento. Um, So it's a podcast about the lives of LGBTQ plus people, businesses and events in and around the Sacramento area. And so um, you can find uh, more information about that on Facebook under Queer Sacramento or under, once again, Instagram or Twitter um, under the handle Queer Sacramento. So there we go. Nice. And get those links in the show notes for you. And I appreciate you having me on. This was awesome. It's nice to be able to hang out with you fellas. I feel like I'm part of the gang. Oh, we always love having you here. So well, thank uh, you. And stay safe. I've got my bandana for my face mask. I hope everybody else has their own. Uh, in any case, uh, with that, uh, there you go. Oh, nice. My mom's making me one too. And with that, say goodnight, everybody. 
Peace. Have a good one, y'all.